Our next video comes from a retired neurosurgeon and answers the question how a President Ben Carson would provide opportunity for all and favoritism to none. Hello everyone at Heritage Action for America. I'm Ben Carson. You know, America is a place that was designed for the people. It was supposed to be of, for, and by the people. The government's role was to facilitate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for the people, not for themselves. This is what I think has been forgotten. And uh, one of the reasons that I've gotten into this fray is to see if it's possible, because I actually believe it is, to return America to the people, the people at the pinnacle, the government there to serve the people. We need to have a government where everybody has equal opportunity. We don't give anybody special favors. Our Constitution guarantees the rights of every American citizen, but it does not guarantee extra rights or special rights for anyone. And when we can grasp that concept and not always be looking for the special treatment, I think we will go a long way toward reestablishing the kind of atmosphere that will allow America to grow once again and to thrive and to create a tide that lifts all the boats. And that is perhaps one of the things that has created the most friction and has allowed the purveyors of division and hatred to be so successful, creating a war on women and racial wars and income wars and uh, religious wars and age wars and basically you name it they have a war on it. That's much more difficult to do when people feel that they are being treated fairly and equally and that's where we need to concentrate. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Dr. Ben Carson. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Dr. Carson, welcome. And your first question comes from Debbie. Dr. Carson. You've had a long and esteemed career as a pediatric neurologist. As such, you've operated on babies in the womb. What has been your reaction to the Planned Parenthood videos? And what actions would you take as president to protect life? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me here on my birthday. Uh, <laughs> And, and what, a, what a great birthday present. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. You know? <laughs> thank you. I guess. I guess the, birth, the best birthday present is, I heard Donald Trump had dropped out. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, that was just for today. <laughs> now, just kidding. Actually, I think it's very important that we have all the different personalities and voices because they bring different people into the, the fray. People who used to sit on their hands, and we need everybody involved as long as they realize when the process is over, they need to get behind whoever the nominee is. That is a very important factor. Now, as far as Planned Parenthood is concerned, you know, my entire professional career dealt with trying to save children and provide for them quality of life. That's actually the reason that I'm in this now. And when I look at the things that they have done, and I look at their founder, Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist, who didn't like people who looked like me, 
obviously, I'm not that interested in anything that she founded. You know, I want to see, you know? So, but the worst, the worst part is that the majority of Americans disagree with the tearing up of babies and the destroying of human life that this organization is engaged in. So why should their taxpayer money be used to fund that kind of activity? What happened to America? And, you know, we have a president who says, if funding for that is not in there, I'm going to veto it. Well, I personally believe that Congress needs to call his bluff on that. You know? And, you know, Congress has tools also. They can defund everything. They can defund his breakfast. So, you know, I... Uh... <laughs> Dr. Carson, last year the California Health Department uh, ordered all state health, private health care insurers to cover elective abortions, even religious institutions. A bakery in Oregon was fined hundreds of thousands of dollars for refusing to cater a gay wedding. Do you think America needs greater religious liberty protections that are currently in place? Well, we have a constitution, and it has a First Amendment, which protects religious rights. What was not anticipated was a judicial system that considered itself supreme to everybody else. That's, that was the problem. And if you read the Constitution carefully, it makes it very clear that civil matters should be handled at the local or the state level. The reason for that, there was a very good reason for that, it's because the legislators and the judiciary at the state level have to respond to the people. They can get, be elected and they can be put out of office, but once you kick those things up to another level, then we begin to have a problem. We end up with an oligarchy, and this was never the intention. And the reason that we have a, a balance of powers and separation of powers is so that when one branch of the government gets out of control, the other branches are supposed to bring it back into control. And we need to start looking at some other ways to make sure that we don't continue down this pathway. And I guarantee the Congress that they do have the ability to take any kind of legislation, no matter where it came from, and to alter it in order to make sure that it's consistent with our Constitution, and that's what they should be doing. Dr. Carson, in 2013, as the Senate was debating whether to grant illegal immigrants amnesty, you said, quote, of course allow illegal immigrants to have a pathway to citizenship. Last year, you suggested that those here illegally would need to leave the country in order to become guest workers. And this year, you seem to have suggested that guest worker status should be allowed for those country in the country without having to leave first. What is your position on those in the country illegally, and how would you explain it to those Americans who are concerned about granting amnesty? Okay, thank you. You know, one of the things that I've been doing is going around the country, spending a great deal of time listening. And I go to all sections of the country, every demographic, because the country is supposed to be of, for, and by the people. It's not supposed to be of and for any particular uh, political figure or figure that's non-political like me. Uh, so I have come to the understanding, particularly after visiting the border, that we can absolutely seal our borders. There's no question about it. And uh, all we have to do is look at what's been done successfully before. You look at what was done in Yuma County in Arizona by using a combination of the right kind of barrier and putting people there to monitor it and having a judicial system that prosecuted first-time offenders instead of a catch-and-release program, it was extremely effective. And we can use that along not only the southern border, but we can use a, a variety of things to seal all of our borders because it's not just people from Mexico and Honduras we're worried about. It's 
Islamic radical jihadists who want to destroy us. And we have to make sure that that's not the case. And in addition to that, if we cut off the goodies, there won't be any reason for people to try to get in here. Okay? Now, additionally, there's still going to be a group of people who are left here. And what do we do with them? I don't think it is possible to round them all up. Just the judicial system itself would be clogged up for many, many years to come. However, in talking to many farmers, they have told me that they cannot get anybody to harvest the crops and to take care of the crops. And I don't see any reason at all that we cannot have a guest worker program to get that kind of work done. Any kind of work that Americans don't want to do, we ought to have another mechanism for getting it done. But the guest, in order to be a guest worker, you have to have a pristine record. You have to sign up within a certain period of time. You have to pay a back tax penalty. You have to pay your taxes going forward. You don't get to vote, and you are not a citizen. So, Additionally, I believe that we ought to be doing some of the things uh, that allow companies to make a profit in other countries by developing them in terms of their agricultural facilities, et cetera, so that they can stay in their own country and be perfectly happy in doing so. Can you give us a little bit more detail about the guest worker program? Would it be temporary? Would it be permanent? Would they be eligible for federal benefits? I, too much echo there. W would a guest worker under your program, would that be a temporary program? Is it a permanent program? And would those guest workers be eligible for federal benefits while they're in the country? Uh, I think it, those guest workers are not eligible for anything unless we, the American people, decide that we want to make them eligible for it. I think that's the way that it should work. And those are things that we can determine by questioning the people themselves. So, and, and that's the, the, the key point that I want to bring across, is that this country, America, is the greatest country the world has ever known. It is such an exceptional nation. And you know, before, before America came on the scene, for thousands of years, people did things the same way. Once we were on the scene, within 200 years, men were walking on the moon. And when people say we're not exceptional, they are not thinking. We are by far the most exceptional nation, and our job is to make sure that we remain an exceptional nation. And Dr. Carson, our, our nation's debt picture is concerning. You yourself have noted uh, that by some estimates, the federal government's uh, debts accrued to $200 trillion. Yet you've also downplayed the need to address our entitlement programs, suggesting, quote, we shouldn't even talk about entitlement programs until we fix the economy. Many people, in our fe many people feel our nation is on the verge of our own debt crisis. Dr. Carson, can we afford to delay entitlement reform before we face a catastrophic debt crisis of our own? Well, you know, one of the things that I learned as a surgeon is that when people have complex problems, you have to address them sequentially, and it has to be in the right sequence. Otherwise, you will not have a successful outcome. Now, we have a terribly broken system right now. You know, we're not growing anymore. This is the, the, the most powerful economic engine that the world has ever known. And yet, it cannot work because it has been wrapped up with chains of regulation and they come out every month, more and more regulations. Every single regulation costs us in terms of goods and services. It costs everybody, but who does it hit disproportionately? It hits poor people disproportionately. And that's one of the things that's driving the income gap that the left is always talking about. They say you can solve that by taking all the money from the rich. No, you can solve it by stopping all these stupid regulations that are driving up the cost for everybody. And and you have to recognize that yes, we have this tremendous debt and 18 trillion dollars to pay that back at 10 million dollars a day 
it would take you over 5,000 years. We're putting that on the backs of our young people, but that's not the worst part. The worst part is the fiscal gap, the unfunded liabilities that we owe, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, governmental programs versus what we expect to bring in in revenues from taxes and other revenue sources. If we're fiscally responsible, those things should be almost identical. But if they're not, there's a gap. Bring that forward to today's dollars, and you're talking a fiscal gap of over $200 trillion. The only reason we can sustain that is because we can print money, because we are the reserve currency of the world, a title that generally goes with the number one economy in the world, which we were from the 1870s until last year, when China became the number one economy. Fortunately, they don't have the infrastructure to be able to come the reserve currency right now, but they are working on it. But here we are printing money irresponsibly. We decoupled it from the uh, gold standard in 1971. It's just based on our good name, faith, and credit, which is not very good anymore. And if we no longer can print money and we continue down this pathway, we are headed for certain destruction. And what we must do is get our fiscal house in order get the economy rolling again, fix the tax structure so that it can be roaring, providing excellent opportunities for people. And once we have excellent opportunities for people, that's when we reform the entitlements. That way we have everybody on the same page and we're not persecuting people and making ourselves seem unfair. Dr. Carson, do you anticipate in your first term proposing Medicare, Social Security, reforms? Will you, will you get the economy growing quickly enough that we can then move on to that next part of the sequence and reform entitlements in your first term? There are a lot of people who say, you know, it took us years and years to get into this bad situation, and it's going to take us years and years to get out of it. I do not believe that. I believe that if we get in there and rapidly get rid of all of these horrible entitlements, and not horrible entitlements, but uh, horrible regulations, We'll get rid of the entitlements too, but we have to do this in sequence. Get rid of the regulations and we reform the tax system. We get rid of these horrible situations. And one of the ways that we can jumpstart the economy very quickly, there's trillions of dollars, at least $2 trillion overseas that's not being brought back here. I can remember many an afternoon sitting around board, boardroom tables. And a lot of people don't know, but you know, I sat on the Kellogg board for 18 years, Costco board for 16 years. I was the chairman of the board of Axinogen, a biotech company. My wife and I built a national scholarship program that has won national awards. I have a lot of business experience. People think that doctors only know medicine. They're nuts, okay? But, but we would talk about we would talk about all that money overseas and what we could do with it here, but we couldn't bring it back because the corporate tax rate was too high. Well, my suggestion and what I would advocate if I got into office is I would provide a six-month hiatus of tax-free holiday so that that money could be repatriated into our shores at no cost to the American people. And my only requirement my only requirement would be that 10% of it would be used to create jobs for people who are unemployed and on welfare. You want to talk about a gigantic jump start. That would be unbelievable. And there would be the biggest stimulus probably since the New Deal. And yet, it would be something that didn't cost our taxpayers one red cent. Those are the kinds of things that we have to be thinking about. That's low-hanging fruit, absolutely no reason not to do something like that. And then we have to fix the tax structure for everybody. I want something that hits everybody in a proportional way. And if that was good enough for God, that's good enough for me too. And it should be good enough for all of us. And Dr. Carson, it's an honor to invite Governor Haley back onto the stage. Okay. Thank you very much, and happy birthday, Dr. Carson. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, I will tell you, in case you didn't know, you, South Carolina was named the friendliest state in the country, but you could tell when they sang you happy birthday. Absolutely. So they never let me down. 
You know, a lot of people have watched you and they hear what a conservative you are. But will you go back and tell so many of these people actually what your upbringing was? Because you weren't always a conservative. No. Uh, you know, I grew up in Detroit and in Boston. I mean, you want to talk about blue places. If there was another color beyond blue, they would be that. And I grew up in that. And then I went to Yale University. You know, my goodness, talk about liberal. And then came back to the University of Michigan and then went to Baltimore. I mean, so I was a radical Democrat. And I believed all of the stuff that they believed, including that Republicans were horrible, racist people. And then, and then I started listening to Ronald Reagan. And he didn't sound that way. And I said, I said, this man does not sound like that. And then at the same time, I was seeing all these patients coming in. And they were able-bodied people, but they were completely subsumed by the welfare system. And I said, this is not working in their favor. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to get a lot of the downtrodden in our society to recognize. There are ways that you can get out of a state of dependency. Not listen to those people who are always patting you on the head and saying, there, there, you poor little thing. I'm going to take care of all your needs. That's not being kind. And I absolutely agree. In a time where we're trying to bring more people into our party, what are we not doing right, and what can we do more of? Well, there is no question we need to listen. That's right. And you know, one of the things that we do in this country is we've gotten into our respective corners and we fire hand grenades at each other. And it helps to facilitate what the left is trying to do. They're trying to divide us. They want us to think that there's a war on women and racial wars and income wars and age wars and religious wars. And they want us all to believe that we're each other's enemies when in fact they are the enemy. And that's what we need to understand. And, and we need to go out into the minority communities and show them that there is a ladder of opportunity that will bring them out of a state of dependency. And we want them to use the talents that God has given them, working hard. We want to invest in our fellow man because it is our job to take care of the downtrodden. It is not the job of the government. We can do it a lot better than they can. about different places and things. You practiced at Johns Hopkins, and so you, were, you know Baltimore. If you look at what happened in South Carolina and in Charleston, and you look at what happened there, what could have been or should have been done differently to cause a different reaction in Baltimore than what we saw? Okay, well there is, I, you know, it was a story that was really missed by the media because they were looking for sensationalism and they wanted to talk about the flag and they wanted to talk about everything else. But in fact, the people at that church demonstrated the spirit of God. It's the thing that made America great. You know? And that's what we need to emphasize more in our nation. You know, there, the president likes to say that we're not a Judeo-Christian nation, but he doesn't get to decide what kind of nation we are. We get to decide what kind of nation we are. And, And, and I think if we apply those kind of principles in Baltimore, in Ferguson, wherever we are, reaching out to our fellow man with Christ-like attitude, I think we'll be in much better shape. And I gotta tell you, you know, I get a little bit tired of the secular progressives always trying to tell me that 
you know, you're not a good scientist, you're not a good doctor because you believe that God created the earth and stuff like this. Let me tell you, it's supposed to be live and let live. And we are, you know, believing in God, think about this, it's on our money, it's, it's in our founding document, many courtrooms on the wall it says, in God we trust. It's in every part of our fabric. If we can't talk about it, what is that? In medicine, we call that schizophrenia. And we can do much better than that. So we're going a little bit over, but I want to ask just one more question. Everybody sees you as, as America's surgeon. Everybody wants you to be their surgeon. What do you want to say to them to make you America's president? Well, I want America to recognize that this was not something that was on my bucket list of things to do, <laughs> okay? I was, I was looking to retire. My wife was looking for that too. But after the prayer breakfast in 2013, You know, so many of you begin to say that this is something that I should consider. And I finally just said, Lord, if you want me to do this, all of the pundits say it's impossible, that you can't put together an organization, you can't raise the money, which really was quite a relief to me. But I said, <laughs> I said, if you want me to do it, you open the doors. And if you open the doors, I will walk through them and as long as they stay open, I will continue to do so because I want the American people to once again be placed at the pinnacle of this society. This is where it was designed in our country, and this is what it should be. And thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen.